Thoth Hermes podcast. Welcome to the world of the Western esoteric tradition. Friends and listeners, welcome to yet another episode of the Thought Hermes podcast. In fact, this is episode 7 of our season 5. And today is August the 23rd, 2020. My name is Rudolf, I am your host, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this new show. Today's guest in our show for our big interview is Georgia van Ralte, and the show's name today is The Divine Feminine. Georgia is a very interesting personality, I'll tell you a bit more about her in a few moments. For the moment, as I said, it's my pleasure to welcome you here on the show, all of you who have returned here, who are returning customers, as we say. Uh, it's great to have you back, and thank you for your fidelity. And a heartily welcome to all of you who are here for the first time, who discovered Thoth Hermes podcast. It's great to have you with us. We are broadcasting, or I am broadcasting from the outskirts of the lovely city of Vienna, Austria's beautiful capital. And this show is, as we said already, in its fifth season and we are approaching the 75th episode already. Wow, time flies. If you want to find all the previous episodes, you'll find them on all the major podcast outlets. But you can also go on the website. The website is www.thothhermes.com. That is T-H-O-T-H-E-R-M-E-S.com. There you not only find the episodes themselves, but also all the show notes to all the previous and current episodes. So a lot of things to discover there. And... While you're there, why not leaving me some feedback? You can send the feedback across a voicemail application that runs on the website. It's completely free, of course. There's also a contact form on that website. But why not sending me an email on info at thoughthermes.com or go on Twitter or uh, on Facebook and send me your message there. I always welcome your messages. And... It's not only welcome to have criticism or uh, ideas or just remarks or tell me that you love the show, whatever, but also because, as you now know, those who return often here, I'm always looking for some music for the show. Also today, again, we will listen to some music which will which has been provided by one of our listeners. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But um, it's so if you are a musician, if you're an active musician, if you have music that you would like to be played on the show and you want to get in touch with me about that, do send me an email and I will be happy uh, to receive that. And to those of you who have a little bit of a uh, waiting time already, uh, well, I got quite a few uh, musical pieces which one by one I will play on this show and that's why sometimes it takes a month or two until your music actually will be the one to be played. So no worries, please don't hesitate and send me your stuff. And while we talk about that, I have now decided that sometime in the fall, October or November, I will restart my arts page. I had that at the very beginning of the Thought Hermes podcast. I dropped it after a few months because at the time we had a very few listeners and even less people went onto the website. So it wasn't really worst work that I had to invest into that and it was also a pity for the artists that their the view numbers were a little small but that has changed now because many many more people go on the website and many many more listeners come and listen to this show so I am asking you to send me your artwork in photos in yeah well in photos of course and also a description with that and regularly I will 
present a page on the website with artwork by our listeners. Of course, occult art, art that has to do with the subject that we treat here, which is the Western esoteric and occult tradition. So looking forward also to receive that. One last thing about the website. Um, you know what comes now. It's the Patreon challenge. Yes. Um, I have said once we will have 4% of our weekly average listeners as supporters, as patrons on Patreon, I will stop doing this publicity. So we're not quite there yet. Um, and so that's also because the numbers of listeners are increasing. We are actually now in the last eight weeks, if I do the average of the last eight weeks, with, which is the kind of challenge that we have, we are up to 2,800 uh, listeners each week. So that's gone up dramatically over the last couple of months. Um, and that's very nice. But of course, that also increases the challenge. We are now at approximately 115 patrons that we need. We have 42. So guys, go on the patron site, become a patron, and that will stop my publicity for Patreon here. I'm sure you'll appreciate and we here will too, because your support helps us to make this show possible. And to all of you who have already donated or have already become a patron, thank you so much. It's lovely that you support and you make this show possible for everyone else. That's great. Thank you so much. Today is also a big day for us here because it's the first evening here on Sunday, uh, the 23rd of August, that we will have that live lecture in the Thoth Hermes Academy. The first lecture, which is called Individuation Magic, then which will be held by Carl Abrahamson. I'm not sure if you are going to listen to this show before, actually, we start our academy tonight. Um, if so, well, maybe you will still want to get a ticket for this. Um, you can find the link and where to buy the ticket on the Thoth Hermes website of course. Um, if it's too late, well, we have other lectures with followed by live discussions all the time, actually, um, in every three weeks uh, for the next uh, few months. So in three weeks, that will be uh, in mid-September, it will be Angel Minar who is joining us after who we have Frater UD, we'll have David Harrison and David Beth. Um, so if you're interested in any of those live lectures with live discussions, please go to the website, uh, look for the menu point Thought Hermes Academy. There's also a link right on the front page and find your way to get you a ticket. Okay, music now. First piece of music. Well, all three pieces of music actually come from a listener who goes by the name well, I don't know, by the initials R.D. R.D. sent me a nice email about his music and about the group of musicians, I think it is, that he is leading, which are called uh, Moment Line. And, um, well, he sent me a link to his Spotify page, and I will post, of course, that link also um, I said moment line, it's monument line. Sorry about that. So uh, about his music from monument line, you find a whole album there. And the album is called Ojos Adaptandose la, a la Oscuridad. So and I believe, therefore, that they come from some Spanish speaking country. I don't know more about them. I'm sorry. But I know that RD, who sent me the music, he is a student of alchemy and his music also reflects that because the music um, the titles of the pieces have all to do with alchemy and uh, i think this is quite fascinating we will play three tracks from that album here today but there are i think seven more there are 10 tracks all together on spotify um, i have a doubt that the guy is called romeo doracio because that's the copyright notice on the music and RT. Well, could be him, couldn't it? Okay, so Romeo, if it's you, thank you for that. Uh, in any case, we are listening to the first piece of today's choice from Monument Line and their album Ojos Adaptandose a la Oscuridad. And 
This first piece is called En la mina, la mena, and that translates for those who don't speak Spanish into something like the ore in the mine. Enjoy.
the ore in the mine, or rather, en la mina, la mena, by Monument Line, that group uh, which produced on Spotify an album called Ojos Adoptandose a la Oscuridad. I'm sorry for my Spanish, I hope you understand. All right, we will hear more of them later on, as always. But now let me introduce you to Georgia van Ralte. Georgia, and I'm not shy saying that, I think she's one really of the most interesting young people uh, in the occult world. And she is the, I believe, the youngest uh, interview partner I ever had on this show. And that is really, really exciting because she has a lot of highly interesting things to say. She is um, very, very bright. She is a PhD candidate at the University of Surrey and she is an academic, therefore. She is an author and she's a priestess of Babylon. So another academic who is also an active um, occultist and who says so. Um, her research at the University of Surrey in the UK explores textual initiation, sexual magic, and especially the occult fiction of Diane Fortune. Diane Fortune, I'm sure most of you know about her. And if you want to know more about Diane Fortune, actually, you should go back on our very, very first episode with Alan Richardson, who wrote, who had written one of the excellent biographies of Diane Fortune. But it's exactly about that matter, also about how she was perceived and received in the last 20, 30 years that we talked to George um, van Ralta here today. But that's only part of our talk, Kent. Um, I'm, I'm really very happy that, that she came here to speak to me and did her very first podcast interview. And we really had a nice time. Uh, she talks about the unfortunate and how she became interested in that, so to speak, out of fashion occultist, but that it's completely wrong that she should be an out of fashion person. We talk about Salima today. We talk about orders that become sclerotic. And we talk about the temple of Our Lady of the Abyss, which Georgia is running with her partner. Um, and she is from the UK. You can hear that with her slight little accent, but she now lives in the United States with her kids and her partner. Um, really, really nice person. And uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy. I'm going to read from for you, as I always do now, since we started the season, a little excerpt, not from her new book that she's just been publishing, but from a little essay that she has published on the website of the Temple of Our Lady of the Abyss. All the links will, of course, be in the show notes, which I think is really rather interesting to hear and a good introduction in what you're going to hear in a minute. Later at the same conference, she's talking about the conference that she appeared, later at the same conference, I asked a magical practitioner what she thought of Dion Fortune. My question was met with a sneer. Fortune was old-fashioned and useless, the woman said, and no self-respecting magician had any business studying her work. As an impressionable young scholar, these encounters shocked me. Why was Fortune's work considered so inferior as to be outright distasteful? Last year, I spoke out publicly about my personal experiences of sexual abuse with the Limic communities and the larger trend of which I understood my experiences to be a part. Though many were kind and supportive, my words were met just as often with a sneering dismissal why be involved in magic and specifically sexual magic? The question was put to me, if I was a delicate snowflake that would play victim at the first sign of trauma. Now these two occurrences may appear quite separate, but they are deeply linked. The contemporary magical milieu, particularly as it is manifested in various thelemic currents, is obsessed with edge things. Alice Crowley's perennially popular work is full of blasphemy, murder, rape, revolution, anything bad or good, but strong. And indeed, this seems an admirable enough aim in our current society, evolving as it is toward a whitewashed nanny state hyper reality, as it did in the repressive late Victorian area. Dion Fortunes is quite the opposite and can be characterized as a socially responsible and accessible to the middle classes 
form of magic. Those who follow the work of each tend to be divided quite neatly by taste and type. However, what has been almost entirely lost from our magical histories is the way that these two disparate authors wrote polemically in reaction to one another and to the magical milieu of which they were both a part. And this is rather a dangerous thing to have forgotten. I think this is also a highly interesting art article that I invite you to read, really. Um, it goes on for uh, much longer, and I believe there is many interesting things that you will discover in that article as well. But uh, when you have listened to the interview, we'll know that Georgia has a lot of interesting things to say. Um, once again, go to the show notes to look her up and to look those articles up. But now, for the moment, um, I can only say let's go to meet Georgia von Ralte in the United States. And we will come back in about 33 minutes for the break. Don't forget that in this show you now have always the chapter marks also on YouTube. You can find them and um, can jump to the beginning of music or interview parts. Right now, Georgia von Ralte, let's meet her. Here comes the interview. It is a great pleasure for me tonight to have a very special guest here on the Thoth Hermes podcast. And I must say it is very rare for me to have someone here whose father I could be, to be honest. <laughs> uh, well, some of you know that I have had my 60th birthday a few years, a few days, my God, no, a few days ago only. And um, well, today we have a, a young lady here in front of the microphone who lately has made herself quite a name in the occult and, and uh, magic circles. And I'm very happy to have Georgia van Ralte here in, at the microphone of uh, Thoth Hermes. Good evening to you. You're over there in Atlanta, Georgia now. Uh, it's great to have you here, Georgia. Hello. Thank you so much for having me on the show. And I'm really glad to be here. No, it's great to have you. So, um, well, the, the real reason that we are here today, Georgia, is that you have recently published your first your first book, but there is already a second book in in the coming. We'll speak about the books a bit later, but that was the initiation. But actually, um, it has been some time that I have been watching what you're writing and doing. And um, one of the first articles or first writings by you that I came across was a rather small article that you published. I don't even know exactly when. Um, it's called um, Sat Satarial Shroud, Sex, Power and Ethics in Contemporary Thelema. And um, what struck me was not so much the title of that. Um, we come maybe to the background of that a bit later. But um, that in a way you compare um, Diane Fortune and her way of approaching things uh, to those of Alistair Crowley and especially the, the perception of those two today. And I found that really fascinating and rather extraordinary that a young person would, would talk about that and also in that way. So um, let's start there. What, what was initially the, the context of this of this article and why would you come to your opinions? Uh, maybe you talk a bit about that, uh, what you what your thoughts are on that. So um, I begin the article and I think that's very much how I began that train of thought. I had I remember this conversation I had at a, a court conference mm -hmm. uh, with a person who was talking about um, Crowley, as a matter of fact. And I said, oh, you're talking about these initiatory elements of his fiction. That's so interesting because that's what I do with Dion Fortune. And the person said, oh, I don't really like Dion Fortune. I don't think there's any depth there. And I said, no, no, no. I, I, you know, I've been studying this. I think there's this amazing thing going on. Really, there's not enough darkness in her. And I don't think that she's something suitable for modern people to be studying. And I thought it was such a fascinatingly odd thing to say. Mm -hmm, um, but I've, I've come across that sort of approach quite a lot, actually, um, when I bring up to academics and to practitioners that I study Dion Fortune, 
a lot of the first response is, oh, well, she's a bit boring. But she's not, she's not boring. What she isn't is dangerous and countercultural in quite the same way that Alistair Crowley is thought to be. And one of the specific things that I think is really at stake, it's not as much an aesthetic thing as it is a moral thing. Crowley was morally revolutionary. Dion Fortune wrote at length about there being moral revolution being useless because it only ever leaves women at the bottom of the pile and that really there must be a slow evolution, not a rapid revolution. And it really feels like in the kind of century since then, Crowley continued to be this, you know, crazy countercultural figure that everybody loves. And Dion Fortune became more and more sidelined as this sort of, you know, interwar, fussy woman who tried to, as if it's a bad thing that she tried to make occultism accessible for women. Uh, as if it's a bad thing that she tried to make it morally responsible and psychologically sound and healthy. Um, which I think that occultism has a little bit of a, you know, fetish for danger. So it's not very interesting to talk about the moral responsibilities related to initiating somebody. But that's the kind of thing that fascinated Dion Fortune. And it's been the kind of thing that's fascinated me because it's... It's easy to be revolutionary. It's actually a lot more difficult to think about the slow evolution and to think about the social and moral consequences of a magical act. But I think that's sort of, not to be preachy, but that actually is what you have to do to get anywhere. And I think as I've been studying Fortune's work more and more, I've come to see that she's actually had some really profound influences, cultural influences, in many ways more so than Crowley, just in different ways. Mm. And so that, yeah, has very much been something that's been influential both on my academic work and on my own practices. Right. Um, let, let's talk a bit about yourself uh, and your background. Um, is your academic or your practice background prior? So what's, what, was, what was there first? So I'm, I'm a bit of a rarity, it seems, in this respect, because my academic background came first. Mm -hmm. I, I did my undergraduate degree in theological studies at St. Andrews. Um, so, you know, I studied Greek and Bible studies alongside 20 other students who were mostly training for the ministry, Scottish Presbyterian. It was very interesting. Right. Um, and I finished that and I was originally going to do, uh, well, I wanted to do a religious studies MA. And quite by chance, I came across the one at uh, Amsterdam. Uh, sorry, why did you start in the first place at religious studies? What was your intent in the first place? Uh, for the MA or for the undergraduate? Okay, okay, so for teaching and then... Oh, no, for the, for, the, for the undergraduate, when I took the theological studies, it was just a fascination. I was I was going to do philosophy, and then at the last minute, I decided that religion was just too fascinating. Right. So yes, everybody else was sort of training for the ministry, but I was just there for the ride. Um, I, I always assumed I would teach, um, and I came across uh, the the center at Amsterdam for Esotericism studies, and I took my MA there, and that was actually my first introduction to the occult world were my first right. classes with Vada Hanegraaff and Marco well, Passi. Was there, well, Ronnie Graf probably was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, the first time I ever heard Crowley's name was in one of my classes there. And that was the beginning of things. And in fact, I didn't really begin what I, although obviously I can reflect back and see things that have influenced my practices and such like, I didn't really begin my magical path proper until after I'd finished the MA. Um, and just before I began the PhD. Which would have been, what, three, four years ago, right? I've been doing the PhD for two years. So yeah, four years ago, I really began yeah. the magic mm. proper. Mm. So the, the academia very much came first. Interesting, as you say, it's very. We had three weeks ago. We had Henrik Bogdan here on the show, which Massive. was also almost the first to have a real academic here, and so you're the second here. <laughs> um, but um, it's he, he seemed to have a little bit the same path, but he's not. He's not as explicitly talking about his activity nowadays. Um, but um, 
what about that? I mean, now you uh, you have finished your PhD now, or, or no? No, I no. I have about eight months left. I would say right. So. How does it feel for you and how do you think it feels or how is it perceived by, by the outside world, by the others, um, that you are such an active practitioner and also a, a pronounced practitioner uh, and at the same time an academic? How, how do you lift that uh, situation? I mean, it's, it's been very interesting. <laughs> it, I think that in many ways I'm sort of a very lucky product of my time and setting because... Mm -hmm. I began this esotericism study and I had already had, of course, a background in theology. So I was already used to people bringing their faith and experiential, you know, religious knowledge into, you know, uh, degree level work. And but I was quite happy just being an academic until about a year or two after my MA, I began going to practitioner events in the UK and conferences and such like and really meeting esotericists and practitioners mm. and it sort of never occurred to me to keep the two separate so I sort of started beginning to think about these things and I began beginning to write um, in a more theological mode as opposed to an academic mode and it really didn't occur to me until quite some time had passed that possibly I could have used a different name for the practitioner things. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> But it, it became a sort of a sort of principle. Um, I actually ended up writing a book chapter about this in the Trans States volume about the fact that I think the study of esotericism had to make a very clear stand between itself and the practitioners at a certain period in history to become academically viable in the academy. And that's one of the things Hannah Graff really did for the field. But I feel like we've come to a point now where It's this sort of, sort of hidden secret that everybody knows that most of the academics have some form of practice. And I'm not very good at that sort of polite head nodding secret knowledge. Mm. And so it just, it always felt very silly to me. Um, and I didn't want to do that with my own work. I had a few people tell me that it was going to be problematic and that it would be hard to be an academic in a way that was acceptable within the academy while being a public practitioner. But so far, I haven't found that it's been problematic. As long as I think it can be problematic if one begins to, you know, impart religionist uh, tendencies into the academic work they're doing. But yeah. my academic work and my practitioner work are sort of very separate. So... I think, I mean, and I'm, I'm not sure if they'll stay separate. I have a feeling post PhD, I'm probably going to end up in the boroughs of auto auto ethnography, okay. trying to find a way to bring really the practice into the academic field. Mm -hmm. But I think now is the time, as it were. I don't think I'm the only body, only person taking this approach. R right. No, I, I agree. I, I, I sense that very clearly over the, it's not, has not been long, a year or two only that I really sense that, I mean, you are more in the middle of the academic field, but I, me as an outsider, I can really sense that I even get approached by some colleagues, I don't give names here, but who, who would like to get on the show at some point to talk about it. And I find that interesting because it's, I think it's very necessary and a very, a very positive one, but then I'm not an academic, so um, you know it better than me. No, I, I, I very much think so. I think there are, it's not a matter of a free for all and it shouldn't be, but I definitely think it's time to begin breaking down that boundary. And there's mm. been a number of conferences recently, like the Trans States and Conjuring Creativity that have been explicitly about blending academic and artist practice. And I really think that's the way to go. And they've been really amazing events to have been part of mm. the ones that I have. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I could talk about this particular uh, topic for hours, but I think uh, that go, go. <laughs> <laughs> there's, you know, there's a deep historical reason for why it was really necessary to say, we do not practice these things that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also led to a sort of overview of the field that's not terribly accurate. And I'm currently writing a chapter for a book that hopefully will be published in a Palgrave collection 
about the way in particular feminine and femi female bodily experience has been right. really left out of the equation. And mm -hmm. it continues to be one of the least studied things. And specifically when it comes to things like morals and it comes to things like the moral implications of Crowley's writing, people, especially academics, really don't want to touch that with a pole. Right. But it's something that needs to be studied. Um, Certainly, yeah. So there's a there's an element of sort of bringing feminist critical discourse into it as well to say, no, yeah, I have this conversation with epic friends with epic friends of mine, uh, academic friends of mine a lot that there really aren't any other fields where it's a rarity to bring in post-colonial discourse or feminist discourse or queer discourse. Mm -hmm. But in the field of esotericism, that's still seen as somewhat a specialist or sidelined area. Yeah, yeah. And we don't, that's not necessary. <laughs> No, that, that's a very important point. I, I make a note of that, that we go into that a bit deeper in a minute. Um, I just would like before we go that because it's somehow maybe it may it might be linked anyway. Um, what in the first place before you wrote that article we started with, what in the first place uh, brings a young person um, to study Diane Fortune and her novels um, and choose that as your, I think your, uh, it was your, the topic of your, of your degree. My uh, amazing degree. Uh, right, right. So why, uh, what, there must be, it must have been something, right? I mean, there was, and actually that's a very fun, funny story to tell in the context that you've brought it up because I didn't want to do Diane Fortune. I, my uh, supervisor, I just public knowledge, so I'm not sure I think it's okay to say, but it was Marco Passi. And I remember coming to him with my ideas and I wanted to do scarlet women and menstrual fluid and bataille and I had all these great ideas. The rough he, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and he sort of sits me down and he's like, Well, this is wonderful. But how about Dion Fortune? And I'm, oh, no, that's, that's boring. All the same things that everybody else subsequently says about her. Ah, oh, she's fuddy-duddy and boring and 40s housewife. And he says, no, she's not. Take the time. Nobody has studied her. And some people have now, but at that point, there really was maybe two academic articles and three PhDs that had ever been done on her. And I began reading her novels, and I realized that ah, they're very PG-13. Nobody ever has sex. She goes off it, she hates drugs, she hates anything that's you know, naughty. But that she was actually doing something far more important than just railing against, you know, current social discourse. She was actually trying to actively teach people esoteric um, techniques. And more than this, she was trying to actually initiate through her novels. And that's when I was like, oh, this is really amazing and sort of plunged on in. And having done her for the MA, I realized there really wasn't anything else that I could do except to continue studying her and trying to work out mm -hmm. exactly what and how that she was trying to do. Right. Interesting. I'm sure you know Alan Richardson then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we spoke. Yeah, he was the very first guest on, on when I opened this 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 uh, podcast that three and a half years ago. Yes, yeah. Yeah, um, so uh, I find that fascinating. But let's go back now to what you just said before, to the to the need of introducing. Well, you said it much better than I can say that uh, to introducing feminist and post-colonialism as well work um, into the realm of esotericism because it's always been seen as some strange outsider work right I, I give an example i was working in the in the opera business for a long time and when we had the very first female conductor in our opera house uh, a woman's magazine came up to me and wanted to interview her and i intervened and I said no because you're only interviewing her because she's a woman uh, i don't want you to do that i want you to interview her because she's a good conductor <laughs> and so that made a bit of an upheaval then but i think it's a bit the same situation where this part of my world was 20 years ago um, uh, as we are today with esotericism would you agree i i actually would i think that it's it's almost more complex because you do have articles and special editions and books on these topics, but they're always rarities. And I think the really the thing that kind of sells it for me is whenever there's a 
introduction or summary or dictionary or something that's supposed to be a general scope of the field about esotericism, there will be no queer theory or mention of homosexuality. There will be no feminist theory or maybe a small entry on women. There will be no post-colonial theory, maybe something on India. Mm -hmm. And it just seems that they are still considered these sort of specialist niche topics. Like, oh, oh, you did a paper on feminism and occultism, that's nice. But to me, every paper on occultism should be bringing in the insights of feminist theory because mm -hmm. we live in a post-feminist theory world. So to kind of be ignoring these huge bulks of, I mean, humanities-based critical theory becomes quite problematic at a certain point. And how do you go for that? How do you how do you make that better? <laughs> well, to do the work. Um, there are mm. some amazing people working on post-colonial theory and race theory and esotericism. Uh, there is beginning to be some queer theory brought into that, although I would still say that's one of the weakest uh, elements, which is particularly fascinating considering occultism as a counterculture, that that's really important to it. Mm -hmm. And there are definitely some advances now being made with the study of women. I would still say that Very interestingly, a lot of the new work that I see that centralizes women within occultism still seems often to have not read much feminist theory as opposed mm -hmm. to just having studied a woman. But I think it, it's something that can only change slowly. I do, however, think that there needs to be a kind of general recognition that these things aren't niche. Something I often run up against both in academia and in practice, in fact, is that My experience, thoughts and work as a woman focusing on feminine experience is nice in this small, you know, self-contained mm -hmm. bubble over here as long as mm. it doesn't seem to make out that I'm making a point about anything larger. And it's Don't disturb the, 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 the long time story. Right. <laughs> Very much so. Um, but even that, I think even in the short time I've been doing this work is beginning to change. And I think mm. I, this goes back to one of the reasons that I decided, or it didn't seem like a choice to bring my, to be a public practitioner and a public academic is because it's only by doing the things that you can change anything. Definitely. Definitely. Which, of course, is the unfortunate whole point. So. <laughs> yeah, but somehow, and I don't want to, to run compliments here, but I think it is much more helpful to run Uh, an MA on thy fortune in that view than to run another deep, dark, black counterculture thing in that point of view. Uh, And this was one of why you chose it. I mean, that was what I realized when I really got into this stuff was that one of the problems is when people do pick women or sexuality, they pick the outliers, the really yeah. interesting stuff. But yeah. actually what's really amazing about Dion Fortune is that she was so middle of the road and yet so revolutionary. And mm -hmm. I think it's keeping that tension that's so important. Um, yeah. Yeah. Could you define by two or three points why she was in that respect that you just mentioned so outstanding? Can can you can you pin that down a little bit? In the sense of why her and herself, or why the work she produced. Ooh, well, whatever, probably work, but 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 maybe if it's easier herself than do. You know, and that, it makes me think about, you know, something a lot of biographers like to say, Fortune's had four biographers and they've all repeated mm -hmm. variations on that she wrote Moon Magic because her husband had left her and mm -hmm. she was middle-aged and she was going through menopause and that mm -hmm. was why she wrote this desperate book. Well, you, d you don't get anybody talking about male practitioners of like that ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, it made me realize that so much is made of the fact that she wasn't exciting physically. She didn't have this exciting life in the way that people want, which actually specifically means she wasn't slutty enough to be considered an exciting yeah. female. That's actually the point. What's amazing about Dion Fortune is that she wrote about sexual magic, not sex magic, but sexual magic, the use right. of sexual energies in a way that was accessible to normal women. So this my, my MA work was about the way that there was already an avenue for a certain kind of upper middle class to upper class woman to escape normality and live this scarlet woman-like existence. There were options mm -hmm. for that. That was what Bohemia mm -hmm. was about. What there wasn't many options for, apart from really the Theosophical Society, was a space for respectable women to be respectable while practicing magic. 
And I often hear people go, well, why do they need to be respectable? And of course, it's the 1930s. So they have mm. children and husbands and, you know, not many career prospects because they're a young woman. And to someone like Alistair Crowley, that would be a sign that they didn't care enough. But to someone like Dionne Fortune, she thought that that was perfectly accessible, acceptable and that mm-hmm. there shouldn't be this sexist refutation of access because a woman doesn't have the financial or social resources to become a pariah. Yeah. And that to me is the really amazing thing that Fortune gave and that we can actually see a really direct transmission from her work through to the very feminist sort of new age stuff, which again is derogated for being too fluffy, but of course is a way to be a spiritual woman without having to leave contemporary society behind. Yeah, 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 without having to leave children and husband, and yeah, exactly. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Which, yeah, it's important. What, while now this is my personal opinion, and I probably will be beaten for that by some here, but um, when you see what, for example, Crowley did down in Chefalu, um, uh, I sometimes had the impression, again, I'm not a Thelemite, I'm not a specialist in that field, but uh, you sometimes get the impression that he was acting out this male dominance in a in, in 120% way, right? I mean, I actually think it's far more, I have done academic research on Chefalu and what they were trying to do there. There were times, I think, more so with Victor Newberg than at Chefalu that Crowley seemed to be acting out ideals of dominance. Actually, a lot of the Chefalu experiments involved him in the subjugated position. Mm. But he, um, you know, there's a Norman Flood quote that they were experimenting with the mysteries of filth. Mm-hmm. So I wrote an academic piece about Bataille and about the idea of um, complex and the things that we consider gross or disgusting yeah. and that yeah. Crowley was very actively experimenting with these things. There's the Greek word for that, which I forget. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And I think that that he did have a, a theoretical thing going on under these, you know, grotesque, horrific experiments that people like to mm-hmm. talk about. And I do think the work he did was important. I just think actually a lot of the contemporary fascination with him has very little to do with this amazing work through the deep complexes of society and far more to do with how that looks from the outside in the 21st century. Because of course, undertaking that sort of thing in Victorian times, and I do think Crowley had all sorts of problems and in particular never quite got over this kind of disgust with the body. So I think more than the subjugating women, there was a deep undercutting ideal of subjugating the flesh that I think is where a lot of the really masochistic things came from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't think Dion Fortune shares that either. I think she had a far more positive view of what it means to be inside a body doing magic. Yeah. Which which I think is one of the key reasons that she thought it was okay to be socially and financially successful while doing magic and that it wasn't a sign you know, that she didn't go off and hide in a... She actually did go off and hide in a monastery in Glastonbury, but it... No, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. You, you just made that interesting point and maybe you can... Uh, I mean, it's, it's when you think of it, it's, it's obvious, but maybe you can explain it with your words. Um, the difference between sexual magic and sex magic, mm. you just uh, pointed it out, and I think it's a very important one. So maybe you can say a bit more about that. And that, that can be, I mean, a huge topic, but in the most succinct way when I'm talking mm. about those two things. So Crowley's sex magic was about utilizing the energy of orgasm to achieve magical ends. Mm-hmm. Fortune sex magic or sexual magic was specifically about using magic to, um, she calls it grounding the force. So she says that you cannot, you, you cannot do magic and orgasm at the same time. Those are impossible. So to her, magic is an alternative to orgasm. So you're still raising all of these erotic and sexual energies, but instead of grounding them in orgasm and you know picturing the great work or whatever, mm-hmm. you are actually then using all that force in a ritual that if successfully worked, you should be completely grounded and feel like you've just had an orgasm. That's her right. sort of idea. Um, right. And she does some really funny now but interesting stuff about this about um in a problem of purity she's talking about it's it's 1924 so it's just after the war 
and she's talking about all these people who can't get married and she recommends magical techniques for psychic masturbation so that they can send their energy to the good of the society instead of wasting it that's kind really? of great that. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, sounds, that sounds interesting yeah <laughs> um, but definitely she was a she was a very interesting personality and and, and I'm, I'm glad that you kind of took her in because it's it's um, in one of your other articles, you said something also that struck me. I don't remember which article it was. It's, it says the laws of magic can be condensed into the idea of polarity. And that's a very hermetic saying. I think it was in the Temple of the Abyss. We come uh, Temple of Our Lady of the Abyss, which we will come to a bit later. But um, um, could you... Uh, in your personal point of view, I mean, it sounds like a very hermetic uh, yes. uh, sentence, which which is very close to what I know about and which is close to my practice and my heart. But from somebody who calls herself, well, maybe you don't, but are you calling yourself a Thelemite? No, I don't particularly no. consider myself a Thelemite No, days. okay. <laughs> uh, so it's it's less surprising then, but, but still, could you... In, in 2020 writing such a phrase it's it's a bit astonishing and I'm, yeah. it makes me happy but why did you write it so and again that's something i learned from dion fortune because she says polarity is the center of all magic and of course mm. dion fortune was far more of a hermeticist than many people think she was yeah agreed mm. it to me and again this this works with the sexual magic and everything and people like to take it's it can be difficult to explain because it's used described using gendered language, right? We're so used to the idea of masculine and feminine forces. Yeah. And I think in very modern, you know, the conversations we're having now, we're trying to avoid these gendered divisions of magic. Yeah. But what we've sort of thrown the baby out with the bathwater a little bit, because what the gendered language was trying to explain wasn't really something about gender or sexuality at all. It was something far deeper, which is polarity. Um, which, I mean, what's Fortune loves describing it according to electrical circuits, you know, um, the two way, something has to be, wow, trying to actually explain this is surprisingly difficult, <laughs> but there, it goes with the circuit things. There must be an active and passive pole and the energy must circulate between them. Yeah. What's truly fascinating about Fortune's understanding of the active and passive poles is that the active pole is an active passivity and the passive pole is a passive activity, which of course is deeply Kabbalistic. So there's the passivity that pulls, and this is the feminine pole, the female initiatrix who, or the anima, to use a Jungian phrase, pulls the energy forward. That means the active, which is actually going out, becomes the passive, and it all is this beautiful flux. Mm -hmm. And that's very much what Fortune and Indeed I see the best metaphor for describing magical forces is probably along the lines of polarity, I might put. Right. Okay. Um, because when you, when you take, um, well, if I say the classical approach to the seven hermetic principles, we talk in fact about the 19th century and that's a bit strange, but um, we know what we talk about. We talk about those seven principles, right? You have the principle of polarity, but you also have the principle of gender. Um, you have them, yeah. I wouldn't even say split, they're just two distinct things. And is, is that is that also true for you or would you would you unite them more? Oh, no, absolutely. And that's one of the things that's been really interesting, specifically regarding Babylon theology, is that is very much a sort of contentious issue, is whether mm -hmm. the positionalities of Babylon, the Scarlet Woman and the Beast are biologically gendered positions. Right. I don't think that they are. I actually don't think Crowley even necessarily thought that they were. I think the, the, it has developed through kind of, especially I think the Grant's input of the colors created even more of this idea that sexual fluid equals potency. But to me, it's all far more fluid than that. I think there is mm -hmm. a gender separation, but that whatever you're gonna make with that, as Fortune said, polarity exists on a higher level. So you can get into polarity with a book. The Earth operates according to polarity. Physics and right, exactly. circuits yeah, operate yeah. according to sure. polarity. Mm. Um, gender in magic is a whole different massive ball game and issue with its own many layered things. Definitely, definitely. Okay, no, I think, I think we agree on that one. <laughs>
I had really an enjoyable time to speak to Georgia van Ralte, and I hope you can hear that because uh, it was really nice to have her. Um, so interesting to have somebody in front of you. Well, for me, it's a new experience. I am now 60. I turned 60 last week and she is not even half my age. And it's very, very good to see how there are those young people emerging and doing great jobs. And also that the occult world gets more and more part of the academic world. And uh, I, I think there is very much to be expected from that development in the future. Right. We'll go back to her, to Georgia, in a few moments. But for the moment now, we are going to listen to another piece of music by Monument Line. And our friends have sent me those tracks. And I'll play you another track, which, of course, also bears a name that has to do with alchemy, because um, they are, he is an alchemy student, RD, and... The second piece we're going to hear, it's a French title this time, is called Rose Magnétique à Pétale Soudé, which translates roughly into Magnetic Rose with Welded Petals. Those of you who are alchemy students as well know what that means. I'm not going to tell you more, but we're just going to listen to that other lovely piece of music by Monument Line. Rose Magnétique. A pétale soudé.
Pétales magnétiques à pétales soudés. Well, you can hear that my French is a bit better than my Spanish. Well, I have lived, or well, I lived, I have not lived, I lived for 11 years in lovely France. So that is why. Magnetic rose with welded petals. That was by Monument Line, uh, giving to, uh, given to us by their producer, their leader, um, R.D. Okay. Now we return to speak again with Georgia von Ralte, explaining differences between sexual magic and sex magic as an example, talking about the idea of polarity and how the laws of magic can be condensed into it, and many other interesting aspects of maybe also Alice Crowley and uh, others who are in our occult world very present. Right, at the end of the interview, as always, right away, the third piece of music by Monument Line, the third piece called The Green Dream, this time it is really an English title. And um, well, if you like their, their music, once again, go to the website and look up the show notes. I'll post you a link there. Um, now we go back to the United States to speak to a British girl named Georgia Van Ralte. What an international show that is. Right. Well, we started talking about Babylon and I think it's about time that we go more into, into your personal work there. I mean, that was all very personal, but maybe a bit more towards the academic, leaning towards the academic side of mm -hmm. your work. Um, I don't know. Of course, I haven't really followed your development over the last five or six years, but um, when I, what I can reconstruct, so to speak, um, the moment when you... I don't know if you were, were a co-creator or if you entered it or helped me with that, the Temple of Our Lady of the Abyss. Uh, um, but you are one of the key figures of it, uh, of course. Um, maybe you can give us a bit more background to that and also um, why and when and what was important and is important for you there. <laughs> It's a rather a huge question, but I can try. Um, you get 25 minutes. <laughs> no, so my partner created Temple of the Lady of Tem Temple of Our Lady of the Abyss. Right. Um, a year, possibly two years before I met him. Um, mm -hmm. I should know that. That's terrible. About a year before I met him. We won't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I had already been doing this work um, and reaching out to people and, you know, doing his Babylon thing. And he created, he always says that he created this temple at her request and wasn't ever sure what was, where he was going with it. But it was an egregore that she asked him to create. Um, and I had been doing, you know, I first really got drawn into the practice of magic through the figure of Babylon. And that's very much okay. remained my central. In, in the UK, in your, in your, native, in in your native country, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Um, kind of through Thelema and the OTO, although quite quickly out the other side of that and to different mm -hmm. understandings of what mm -hmm. Babylon is. Um, but I came, we, I, I was writing articles and writing a lot online and he got in touch to say that he felt like we were, you know, doing very similar things and we ended up corresponding. And, um, I both joined him in America and joined his temple and it's very much become ours, uh, in mm -hmm. that time, but more than just ours now, because we have a really wonderful working group based on it as well. So is this a, a group based in where you live in the United States and, or is it, Is it more of a, well, I don't say, like to say the virtual thing, but um, is it is it based on an active meeting group or is it based on a on an egregore that meets somewhere else, so to speak? Well, so we had begun creating an active in-person meeting group and we had done um, a number of personal and public rituals in Atlanta and we had a study group and it was all very exciting. And then COVID hit the world. Oh, um, right. yeah. So that was very much an immediate seizing of all such activities. And in this period, in the past five months or so, we have come together, we have put together or 
it's been more organic than that. People have come and we have created a online or virtual, she said. Doesn't always seem the right word, but that's what it is. No, yeah. Sure. Uh, meetings. So I was, I was going for egregore after that. <laughs> I like, we call it an egregore, very much so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's been really interesting though because i was very skeptical magic online really how are we going to have mm. community or do this work but it's been pretty amazing so i think that i'm i'm excited at the almost the opportunities that this weird moment in time has brought in that regard um we, which which pulls another question out of my head um You were, we were speaking about um, that feminism and post-colonialism was now important and um, how in general um, should magic develop? Because of course, the, well, give me a better word than virtual in that, in that case, but um, the, the, yes, well, the, the, the communication world through the internet, let's put it that way, <laughs> um, is a reality of our day, right? And not, not mm -hmm. only since COVID, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's shown us what is possible maybe, but uh, um, it is there. And uh, always magical societies, occult groups have adapted to what was at their fingertips at the time in the Victorian age, uh, just as we do today. Mm -hmm. So, What is your experience now that you just made and fresh uh, in that respect with your temple of Our Lady of the Abyss? I mean, it's definitely been a sort of interesting experiment in the limits and opportunities provided by the Internet. We haven't ever tried to do... We actually, the original thought is, okay, so online rituals, it's a very obvious one. Mm. But our members are all over the world. So the time difference was a problem, which actually mm -hmm. became great because instead of doing like a Zoom ritual, which I think, I think people do do that successfully. But what we actually did instead was just try to all, so every full moon and every new moon on the same day, though not at the same time, to all meet and do the same visionary rituals. Mm -hmm. And then to report back so that actually the technology that we're really utilizing isn't Zoom and video, the technology is actually Facebook groups, is actually that having a forum that's very accessible um, and that creates the opportunity for a public but also private community space. And we've been really thrilled at, you know, people are very flippant. I'm a, I love Facebook. People are very flippant about Facebook. Mm. But I have found with the Temple of the Abyss page and posting regular writings that I've had people contact me saying, wow, this has really genuinely changed the way I've thought about something. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about that group was making this platform that can be so inane become something really meaningful and become this place that allows us to be really, you know, and people are talking about their most innermost religious, visionary experiences with a group of people they've never met and yet nobody is scared and nobody is inappropriate in response. And it really was quite an amazing realization in, or experiment in how to create community online. Mm. So that's been really interesting um, and wonderful, really. <laughs> Well, I think it's not the tool's fault if you abuse the, the tool, right? If you, if the tool's there, you can use it the right way. You can always make use of it. Um, I have no comparison, but personally, my experience is like yours. Um, uh, the contacts that I made over Facebook within the esoteric and occult world, I wouldn't have been able in my little town here outside of Vienna to make them in three lifetimes. And... Uh, we wouldn't be sitting here and have that conversation, not even privately, if, if it weren't for the internet, right? And I think, you know, esotericists always wrote letters to one another and did correspondence courses and found ways to talk to people on the other side of the world. Why would you not make the most of having a tool that allows that in seconds everywhere? Absolutely, absolutely. Now, is it possible for you to give us a little bit your your view on Babylon, uh, your, your personal, hmm, the personal approach of your egregore, is that the right thing to say? Your basic guide to, to who is Babylon, why are you working with her, for her? Well, I don't know how you would put it. Um, and um, gives us a little bit of insight in what your magic means. 
I mean, I can try. <laughs> That's a lot of big questions. Um, yeah. So I guess I'll try and take those as you gave them. So one of the main things for us, or one of the first things was about um, restoring balance. So the worship of a goddess is chosen not at the expense of a god, and we also work with very masculine presences, but because it's very clear, as indeed you unfortunately knew, that the contemporary world needs a divine feminine presence. And of course, this is one of those things where I wish feminist theory and occultism could join up because feminist theory has recognized since the 60s that we mm. need, or longer if you look at you know the histories of uh, theosophical site and feminism, we need feminine uh, spiritualities, we need feminine initiation narratives, we need all such things. Um, I get, people often don't like my um, accounts of Babylon because I suppose they're rather uh, heterodox according to what you might call orthodox Thelema, which would be the Thelema of Crowley, uh, Parsons and Grant, which for some reason is what's considered orthodox Thelema, though I feel like that's quite an arbitrary judgment. Um, to me, what's really amazing, <laughs> <laughs> what's amazing about, so I don't see it. When I talk about Babylon, I'm not talking about the Scarlet Woman as an office. I'm not really talking about Crowley's Babylon. I just think he was talking more about mine, if you can understand that distinction. OK, yeah. I think yeah. she's a much larger concept. So mm -hmm. and I have this you're going to get me rambling about my theories, but I have this kind of greater theory that or it's very recognizable once you begin doing cultural studies that there's always been this sort of, you know, since, since the goddess has been repressed and we've been living in Christianity, or perhaps even longer, we've had this recognition of this sort of light feminine presence. We can just mm. about deal with Virgin Mother, Sophia, maybe a bit of Shekinah. Okay, that's mm -hmm. acceptable. But equally, we have this great history of monsters and vampires and succubi and witches. And, and you know, and Lilith yeah. and demoness. Yeah. 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 And, you know, Margaret Murray obviously wrote this big, oh, witch cult. It's all a secret witch cult. And obviously she was wrong historically, but she was sort of right on a cultural level that mm. I don't think she would have recognized this. But there has always been. And again, this links to sort of young and this idea of the anima. There's always been this sense. I think everybody senses that there is an aspect of the dark divine feminine that exists. Or if they don't accept that, then that has its own hole and problems in any person's life. I think we tend to fetishize it. Again, the femme fatale, anything that we can do to project something onto the image rather than actually understand what it's representing, mm -hmm. which is that we are a culture that is massively divorced from the idea of a goddess of sex and death. Mm -hmm. But all of the most ancient goddesses were goddesses of sex and death. And that makes sense because as humans, the fundamental things we do are die and have sex. So that to me has always been very fascinating. Babylon, as far as I see it, is a sort of, she in herself is an egregore. Um, she's our veil, the veil that we talk about for this dark feminine. And the reason she's a good veil to me for the modern West is because she is a sort of conglomeration of all of this cultural baggage around the divine feminine. Um, I think that's also the reason people get her so wrong because they hear great whore, holy whore. Cool, mm. I know what a whore yeah. is, great. I will, yeah. okay, so she's a whore and a crown, sweet. Mm -hmm. They kind of miss this idea of the, the forcing together the opposites and such. At like. best, Magdalene, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yes. Yeah. Um, and so I think I lost my thread a bit of what I was answering the question. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's yeah. my. Um, to me, she is. Well, she's not just one representation that's a very interesting thing as i began approaching her from this intellectual level that mm -hmm. i felt like she was really this reification of this ignored dark divine feminine but the more work i've done with her and i've learned from others about how to work with her it becomes clear that she is more than that she is a very visceral force um there's the questions again of how she relates to hga or anima because i think that 
what is considered Babylon force is not necessarily restricted to those who would recognize a goddess called Babylon. I think that mm. it is about recognizing magical technology is innate in the body and in physicality, and particularly recognizing it's what Crowley was after, the divinity of the things that we're taught are the worst bits of physicality. So right. being, uh, I'm not going to be too gross because we're on a podcast, but yeah. you know, anything that you can imagine that's horrible yeah. Yeah. is yeah. the ideal. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, why do you think is must modern? You said that earlier. Why must modern be dark? I mean, why, why, uh, why is that? Because of an excess of light. Because mm. we, I think, and I think occultism as much as Christianity suffers from an excess of light. And when we when we do go to the dark. I, I don't really think she's dark. I think she is the goddess of the gray or the gap. That's what I mm -hmm. jokingly call her to myself. It's just that when you've been immersed in a whitewashed culture, anything that's not whitewashed looks mm. very dark. Yeah. And, you know, I, I love playing and my writing was plays with the concept of what's the most, what can I weird people out with? What can I force together to make people think again about the way that they divide up light and dark, good and evil, holy and unholy, sexy and disgusting, mm -hmm. because those things aren't separate. Those are culturally separated. And to me, she, as a goddess or as an egregore, is about the really powerful magical experience of forcing together opposites and really getting mm -hmm. to the core of those things. Mm -hmm. So she's only dark from one perspective. <laughs> right, right. Right. In, uh, very interesting. This, this great concepts, maybe don't laugh at me, but it almost reminds me a bit of, of, um, of the Lord of the Rings, you know, and mm -hmm. the gray magician, because that's exactly the same concept of the whitewashed concept first. And it couldn't, it needed to be at least gray to, to achieve what it had to achieve. I think so. And I, I think there's almost, you know, that's actually a very good comparison because of course a real adept isn't good any more than they are evil. If, if yeah. everybody in the world thinks a person's good, that person's not an adept because truly to be adept means to live beyond what society considers good and evil. It, good and evil to me are only concepts which change in place and time anyways. So, exactly. Right, right, but right. Dion Fortune says, you know, uh, evil is only force out of place. Right, exactly, exactly. Well, there we go. Should read more Dying Fortune again. Um, talking about reading now, I took that little book in my hand, The Priestess and Pearls, mm -hmm. Rituals for the Journey to the Divine Feminine by Georgia van Raalte. And um, it's a lovely, a lovely book. A, it's lovely to hold in hand because it's, 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 it's just nice and a nice cover. But of course, what's inside it is, is really highly interesting and nice. What... What made you write that book? What what was the intention? Who is it for in the first place, if you can say that? So it's been a it was an interesting book to write. It actually came about um, not it wasn't one of those. I have this book and let's publish it. Um, last year, I was lucky enough to meet Louis and Magdalene, who run Black Moon Publishing mm -hmm. and had some long conversations with them about what they were doing and what I was doing and such like. Um, And they said they would like to publish some of my work. And I said, well, would you like, I have many, many essays and many poems, mm -hmm. or I have a series of rituals. And they said they wanted, first they wanted the rituals. They wanted mm -hmm. new practical exercises um, that were more feminine centric. Because of course, one of the things about ceremonial, ceremonial magic is it can be very masculine centric. So they were sort of, or are sort of seen, not so much as a set of, I mean, if you've read them, they're not really designed that you could do them at home. That's sort of not the point. To me, they were supposed to be, you know, sometimes you buy books of plays to read them and you're, you're reading it to gain the sort of image in your head, just like you'd read a story rather than because you're imagining at some point you might put it on. I wanted to tell stories that the kind of stories that I wanted when I started magic, because one of the first things I started doing was writing rituals because there weren't any rituals that felt like I were made for me. Mm -hmm. Everything required that I pretend like I was a man 
or else pretend like I was what a man thought a scarlet woman should be. And I'm, it just wasn't really my thing. Mm. Um, and, you know, it goes with the whole... Sorry, is this maybe also because you took a certain approach to, to the magic? Uh, you, rightly so for me, but did you... Did you not find, for the thing we said just in the very beginning, because all the feminine based rituals were maybe driven into a certain, into a certain Very much. edge. <laughs> sort of, yeah. you know, square peg, round hole type thing. Um, right, right. No, and I struggled a lot with it. I remember, you know, very early on sort of coming across some of the thalamic stuff to do with, um, you know, of course, men are the only true magicians. And if you're born a woman, well, that's a shame. And hopefully next time you're born, you'll be a man. And, and really being like, this is not what I joined magic for. I could have become a Presbyterian if I wanted this kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I, and, but I was still excited by some of the things. And I, you know, it's not like I was like, oh, screw the Scarlet Woman, because I wouldn't have been doing Babylon work if I thought that. I was very interested at some of the potentials contained therein. And particularly the idea of the eyes of the other and creating rituals that could make people experience things or make the practitioners experience things. And, and the technicalities fascinated me. How does that person get into a trance? Not mm -hmm. because they're just naturally available. What exact mechanism sends them there? And what's the exact mechanism that makes that person watching feel like this is silly or feel like it was the most important thing they ever saw? What, mm -hmm. what is it? Mm -hmm. um, and again, that, that's, that's something that I've never really stopped exploring is quite trying to work out what gives people the experiences and how you can share the experiences, how you can help others see Babylon or mm -hmm. experience that feeling or whatever way it will manifest for them. So I think the book was sort of supposed to be a bit of an antidote, a bit of a, you know, food for the fantasies. Here's something a little bit different. Here's some heavy, heady prose to maybe make you think about things a bit differently. And it's presented in ritual form because to me, it's saying, this isn't just for you. <clears throat> Sometimes when you do get women talk about their magical experiences, they make out, well, it is a very personal thing, but they emphasize that this is just my experience. This is very personal for me and it will be personal for you. And I wanted to sort of go, magic can be very public too. Magic used to be very public. Mm -hmm. And so here's what some public feminine centric magic would look like. Um, right. And that I think was sort of where I was going with it. They were rituals written across the course of four years. So it was sort of, an experience in itself, coalescing them into one volume. And I must say, uh, 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 rituals that need several actors, so to speak, and, and to, yeah. it's, it's not a grimoire for a single person. It's, no. it's for a group of people who want to work the divine feminine and for men and women alike. It's not just for the, the girl who has not yet found her, her rituals, right? No, very right. much so. And I'm aware, I mean, I hope that it's still accessible for those who don't have a group. I mean, it's not like I'm expecting everybody to read it, to have 10 people and immediately go off and do these rituals. But we did. Every, every ritual that's in there has been undertaken by at least one group, most of them several groups independently. Mm -hmm. um, but no, it's... It, Again, and you know, a lot of a lot of magic is really emphasizes the personalness, and that it shouldn't be about any any more than one person. But you know, Dion Fortune believed you couldn't do magic on your own, so that's right at the other end of that scale. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Well, what, what's your take on that? I think I, I she, when she said that she was talking about a very specific kind of magic, and I think she was right with regards to the specific form of polarity magic she was talking about. I don't think she actually believed that you couldn't do any magic on your own. Yeah. But I do think that, especially I found for women, the emphasis on just you being alone can be very, it's just not necessary. Why can't magic be communal? Why can't it be mm. a celebration? Why can't it be a community thing? Um, and I think it's not necessarily a gendered thing, but it just so happens that the way our culture teaches women to be, that often women approaching the occult are more self-conscious, are more less sure of themselves, less, you know, happy to go out and go, cool, I'm sure I can just be a magician. And it's usually women who've come to me for advice or help. And 
it seems to be women who've gotten the most out of our working group as well as a way to find a little bit of self-confidence. Sure. And I've often had people sort of go, oh, well, they should just know better. Why should, why are you providing a crutch? But along with Dion Fortune, I think that that's just not how things work. Um, and if you really want women to participate properly, then you have to help them to participate properly. If a young person, man or woman, but uh, came up to you uh, and say, I, I'm really interested in in starting to, to practice and to work in magic, would you would you suggest him or her to read a book by the end fortune? I do sometimes. Um, yeah. It sort of depends on the person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I often recommend in particular um, Fortune's Esoteric Philosophy of Love and Marriage. Mm -hmm. which, mm -hmm. again, people get weird about because she says some unpleasant things that are very understandable if you understand the context of it being written in um, 28, I think it was written. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it contains, to me, one of the fullest explications of her polarity magic in a practical way. And some of the really very simple things she says about relationships there, I've, I've explained to people, I had them go read it, and they're like, wow, okay, that changes everything. Um, and that's why I think she is valuable to return to. Yeah. And again, I, I have definitely recommend her novels to lots of people, although I'm always wary because I know they're not to everybody's taste, but I think they can be really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. I, what I find interesting, I mean, this is now hard to display. I might, it, with your, with your permission, I might put that also on the website, on the show notes. I find uh, the, the, the drawing that you have on the first page, very interesting uh, of that book, because it reminds, it reminds immediately of the golden dawn symbolism and, and Amork and everything behind that Rosicrucian symbolism as well. And well, uh, I see a vagina in that as well. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure if that's intended. I, uh, but you, you, you'll tell me. Um, but I find that a very interesting uh, summary of what of a lot of the things we're discussing here today, because it's a base of tradition of almost ceremonial magic background, but with a completely new approach through the feminine. Would that? the intention i had never thought of it like that but that's wonderful and i i totally think that there's somehow so the 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 symbol that i consider it now my personal lamen but it was taken from um the vision and the voice uh they call it mm -hmm. the second ether mm -hmm. and near the end somewhere in the middle he describes one of the things the showstones shows and it's a black triangle and thereupon is a rose right. with 156 petals and each have exactly. a devil's face. And on the top of it is an equal armed black cross and thereupon is a Vesca Pisces. Um, and I always thought that was quite the most wonderful little symbol for Babylon that I could have imagined. You know, this base on tradition, sitting on the cross, which is at, of course the equilateral cross, With this Vesca okay. Pisces, and so I oh, just added. Vesca Pisces, okay, okay. So I just okay. added the vulva yeah. to it to make it a little bit more explicit. So you did, you did. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I wasn't completely lost now. Okay, good, good. Because yeah, Vesca Pisces, yes, but there's a bit more there. <laughs> no, no, certainly. Um, and actually, I think there might be an eye therein. In yeah, the, absolutely. In the there is there. You could see an eye there. And absolutely, absolutely. Fascinating. Um, If I may, I will put that on on the show notes because I think it's a it's an important an important sign. Um, yes, well, you're you're also about to publish a second book already, right? I um, mean, yeah. near future. So we'll, tell us a bit about that. So I mean, this is it's going to be all of the. It's been a work in progress for some time. So since mm. I've sort of very much started into this world I've been writing because I write um, and I've ended up with a whole series of essays on a variety of things some of them are on quite specific things some of them are far more I don't know if you've read any of my weird mystical prose but very much in the line of weird often mm. cruelly esque mystical, pe mystical mm. prose and I decided that I was going to put them all together and publish them Only after I, most of them have been published online or in the Facebook group, but I had a number of people ask me, are you going to put them on paper so we can read them properly? So I said, I suppose I will. Um, and I decided I wanted them illustrated. So I commissioned uh, Luciana Lupe Vasconcelos, who is an amazing occult uh, illustrator. Mm -hmm. And she's done a series of beautiful illustrations. They look like something out of a 
Felician Rops or something. They're wonderful. Okay. So that will be published probably uh, fall or winter, more like winter uh, 2020. Mm-hmm. So I'm very excited mm-hmm. for that. And that for will Christmas, be... hopefully. Yes, that's the plan. <laughs> uh, but that won't be published by Black Moon. That will be published under a temple imprint, as the okay. journal Mara was. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Any other uh, plans you can already speak about or too early? Well, I know, I don't know if you saw, uh, I just happen to have a copy here, but this was our uh, temple journal. Ah, yes, I just saw that on the website of the temple. So, exactly. and this Mara. is... Mara. Well, you we have to tell people what we what we have here because they don't uh, see what we are doing here. Uh, yeah. I wanted to, let me find you one of the beautiful illustrations we had by Lupe just for it. Um, Mm-hmm. which I think is one of my favorite. Right, absolutely. Yeah, 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 definitely. So we will be doing, this was the first edition, which was quite a learning curve for two people who've never published a book before, although we had a lot of help. But uh, we will be publishing a, a second one uh, probably in January 2021. Great, great. So that's is that your Equinox? I, that was sort of what it was modeled on, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Got you. <laughs> But uh, we wanted, no, it's, you know, it's great. We very much wanted to do the same thing because I admired so much the Equinox and, you know, having a book with this art and writing that was really inspirational. And a lot of journals these days are done online. And I, I'm a kind of a book, you know, book of bibliophile. So I wanted mm. a book. Say it, a book nerd. A book nerd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can, lots of books in this house. Oh, look behind me. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So that was my kind of fulfillment of my own book nerdishness. That, and mm-hmm. we had so much, you know, I know so many incredible artists, especially female artists, who don't really get published because they're not confident. Um, yeah, yeah. Especially with their more strange or occult themed art. And so we just gathered it all up and published it. And that's been really wonderful. Great. That, that, that's great. Um Well, 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 what shall I say? What shall I say? Um, We're coming a bit towards the end of our talk, I'm afraid. We could go on for ages. Um, Well, we should just repeat that one day, that's all. Um, In any case, it was a really great, great pleasure to have you here, uh, Georgia, tonight. Um, And I know, and you maybe don't want to hear that yet, Um, but there are some people around who say she's one of the upcoming voices of magic in this in this in this coming age and um uh, uh yeah i think the people are absolutely right we should keep an eye on you thank you <laughs> and um thank you for being with us today maybe i don't know maybe there's some final say you want to have something that's important for you or something that 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 you would like to communicate anything i wish i had some kind of wonderful final sentence that would be great um (laughs) but i'm not sure that i do i'm just thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to to speak with you about this and to publicize my love for fortune and for babylon a little bit more sure great well thank you for being with us and um, take care and and uh, all best to you thank you
was the title of the last of the three pieces that I played for you today here uh, by Monument Line. And thanks again to Monument Line and RD, um, who gave me their music, who are listeners to this show, and who have given me the music to be played in our production here today um thank you so much that was great and it was also really great to speak to georgia von ralte van ralte i must say um she is somebody who really should follow in the next years she i'm sure will have many many more interesting things to say also go to the website of temple of our lady of the abyss which i will post also as a link in the show notes this is an interesting uh, church, temple, organization, you decide. And but uh, on top of that, uh, it's not only the explanation of what they do, but it's especially also her essays and articles that you can find there, which I personally find really challenging and interesting. So don't miss out on that. Well, okay, friends and listeners, that was today's show. That was episode number seven of the season five of the Thought Hermes podcast called The Divine Feminine. And it was great to have you here as always. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining me here today. Um, well, I'm sure you want to know what's going on next week. I'm not sure yet, really, to be honest. No, no, uh, seriously. Um, I'm planning finally to return with Ex Libris next week. But it has been some kind, somehow hard to put everything together. It's a bit more complicated to put the Ex Libris show together, to be honest, because you have to meet several people and, and, and build it all up. Um, but I, and the summer, and together with the whole Corona business, um, gave me a few delays. So... Most probably, you're going to hear an Ex Libris show next week. And if it's not going to be an Ex Libris show, then it's going to be a great interview again. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I, of course, know who will be there, but I'll let you know during the week uh, what exactly is going to happen next Sunday. Sorry about that, but that should make you just more curious, shouldn't it? Okay, well, I wish you all a good week. Um, and um, I hope that I will have you back next week again with us here. And maybe you are one of those who tonight will be in the first of our Academy live lectures with Carl Abramson. And if you have not booked your ticket yet, well, it might be a little late because it's already Sunday that we post this show. I'm not sure that the time has not already passed when you listen to it. In any case, in three weeks, there's another one with Angel Millar, which you should not miss all the details. You'll find them on the Thos Hermes website. Okay. So for now, I can only say, take care, stay tuned, hear you soon.